My guest today is Dr. Cody Hong, who holds a PhD in exercise physiology with a special focus in molecular biology of exercise, supplementation, and recovery strategies. He is currently a researcher and assistant professor of exercise science and sports science coordinator at Lagrange College in Georgia, as well as the owner of Soma Scientific Consulting. Cody, really appreciate you taking the time today. Of course, man. I'm, I'm glad to, to be on the call. Well, listen, before we dive into some uh, really interesting topics here today, can you give listeners a little bit more background on yourself and how you got into the research side of things? Sure. Uh, so, like many uh, people in the field of exercise physiology, um, I was an athlete in high school, never really that great. Um, after a couple injuries, um, I wasn't able to continue playing uh, sports. I played mainly baseball and, and football and got really into uh, weightlifting, uh, primarily to get uh, as jacked as possible nice. um, at, at that age. Yeah, so. Uh, that's when I started reading a lot of um, you know, magazines and, and on the internet and just got really interested in how to maximize muscle growth particularly and uh, get stronger. And that led me to study uh, exercise science at East Tennessee State University, which um, serendipitously it was a really, really good program with Dr. Mike Stone there. I, I grew up just about 15 minutes away from ETSU and was fortunate enough to, to study with him. That's terrific. Um, so, I, yeah, I attained my Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Science there at ETSU. Started personal training my junior year of undergrad and um, continued, you know, um, lifting myself and, and my interests peaked towards the end of my bachelor's degree, and that led me to want to learn more, uh, particularly personal training. You know, you get asked questions early on that, uh, you know, to be honest, I wasn't uh, super confident uh, about my knowledge base, and I just wanted to learn more. So I uh, decided to to do a master's degree there at ETSU, and I remember sitting in my first semester of sport physiology with Dr. Stone and um, just being fascinated by the the world of, of uh, the muscle cell, really, and um, physiology in general, and never really looked back from there. I, I just got more interested in uh, the underlying physiology of, of performance, and particularly as it pertains to, to muscle growth and, and strength adaptation. And uh, my Second year, while I was doing my, my master's thesis, I was uh, doing a literature review, and I came across Dr. Michael Roberts, who's at Auburn University, and um, interviewed with him for a PhD. He studies, uh, as you mentioned, molecular biology as it pertains to um, exercise, particularly using cell culture, rodent models, and then, of course, the human models. And I've, uh, I was there for three years. I actually just finished recently, defended my dissertation and uh, learned a ton. Great, great experience there. And now I'm here at LaGrange uh, continuing research and uh, working with athletes and I'm still running a online uh, training and uh, nutrition consulting business. Um, so yeah, I have some online clients. I really enjoy doing that. And yeah, I'm a muscle nerd, so perfect. Uh, we can dig into some of the some of the research I've been able to. to I do think the last that's few years. that's a great uh, jumping off point, to definitely. And uh, you know, one of the first papers uh, of your recent papers that'd be great to discuss is this idea of recovery response, responses to light versus heavy resistance exercise. So you know, what's happening here at the molecular level between light and heavy loads? Is it similar? Is it different? Can you break that down for listeners? Yeah, um, the yeah that was a fun that was a fun project uh, for the for us I guess as the researchers I think it was pretty challenging for the subjects because um, they had to uh, endure six muscle biopsies total in a Ouch. week's time. 
Yeah, so um, blood draws as well. But a pretty straightforward study design and a pretty simple research question um, it, based on some work out of Stu Phillips' lab primarily and, and then some other research uh, within the last 10 or so years. Um, there's a good bit of debate still going on about which is there a hypertrophy rip range? Is there an optimal load range uh, to maximize muscle growth? And uh, Stu, like I said, Stu Phillips' lab has pretty clearly shown that indeed you can uh, realize similar hypertrophic adaptations to light resistance exercise uh, so long as sets are taken to failure compared to heavy um, resistance exercise. And that's it's been demonstrated a couple times out of out of his lab, and um, for me, I, I was particularly interested in some of the acute consequences to training with light loads uh, to failure. I'm, I'm sure, Mark, at some point um, throughout your training career, you've done uh, a set of of I don't know, 30 or 40 percent of your one RM to to failure and. Uh, they're not exactly comfortable. It gets tough um, for sure. Yeah. And uh, it's often assumed that because the load is lighter, um, it's not as stressful, even if you take it to fatigue compared to a um, heavier load. Um, so I, I was really interested in some of the other consequences. You know, yes, maybe the hypertrophic outcomes are similar, uh, particularly in, in untrained individuals, but. In trained individuals, uh, I was curious about uh, some of the molecular signaling, but particularly what are the effects in proximity to, to that session that uh, an individual might train with, with light loads or heavy loads to, to failure? Are there any differences in uh, their recovery responses and the molecular signaling? And uh, what are the implications in terms of programming? So... Um, Yes, yeah, so maybe if we yeah, start with the, some of the key findings and results, and then we can dive into the molecular side, it'd be great. Cool. Um, so yeah, it was a crossover design, uh, 15 subjects. We randomized what order they completed the, the light resistance exercise uh, compared to the, the heavy. So some of them did light uh, 30% of their 1RM first, uh, around a week before they did uh, the, the heavy um, resistance exercise. That was at 80% 1RM. So 30%, 80%, 1 RM, and we collected blood, we collected muscle. So we and we also um, importantly had them perform isokinetic dynamometry testing, which is just a fancy way of, of saying that we measured their uh, force production at different velocities of uh, contraction. So constrained to a device um, that allows you to extend your knee in this case uh, at a certain velocity. Uh, we were interested in seeing if there were differential responses in one's ability to produce force uh, 48 hours later after light resistance training versus heavy. And so uh, we had them perform some isokinetic testing as well. And also we uh, measured soreness through algometry. So it's a little bit, I would say, more objective than just uh, perception alone. It's a small handheld device that allows you to um, slowly press into uh, a muscle. Uh, it's all based on the surface. So there's this little rubber tip and it's um, connected to a, uh, basically a force transducer and it allows you to, to quantify the pressure that you're applying to the muscle and you instruct the subject to tell you when uh, they perceive uh, pain. So then you're able to, yeah, and then you're able to um, associate that that threshold of pain with an actual value in newtons, and so um, if an increase in soreness uh, occurs, then that number would go down relative to a a baseline value, and that is they're experiencing pain at a a lower uh, pressure. Does that make sense? Hundred percent. Yeah. Sweet. So. Yeah, I mean, beyond that, I can, I can talk about some of the specific molecular markers, but the the overarching question related to the, the blood and the muscle t <clears throat> tissue was, excuse me, um, are there any anabolic signaling differences? Is there a differential inflammatory response? 
Um, is there a, a difference in muscle damage? So we looked at creatine kinase in the blood, which is a pretty good marker of, of muscle damage. And yeah, I wanted to, to parse out uh, any of the differences there. And so for the results, without getting too much into the molecular stuff, uh, because there really wasn't much of a difference, um, I, I would rather start with some of the practical differences, uh, the ones that I found interesting and, and probably most meaningful in regards to making a difference in how someone would program uh, this type of training. The uh, muscle damage responses were similar based on, on creatine kinase, so um, no, no real differences there. But what was pretty interesting is the isokinetic testing that I described. Um, individuals after the light resistance exercise to failure. So that was four sets, as many reps as possible. That was to a cadence of a metronome. I should have stated that earlier. So it was tightly controlled. Um, their ability to produce force was more impaired after the light resistance exercise to failure compared to the heavy uh, condition. And, yeah. and that was unexpected and, and pretty interesting. I was going to say definitely pretty interesting, something that I think most strength coaches off the top of their head or trainers would, would definitely think the opposite, right? Yeah, so if, if you had asked me, my working hypothesis before the study was that the heavy condition would have, a, have resulted in a, a worsened ability to produce force because both conditions, you know, were taken to failure. Um, so that was that was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and then, yeah, beyond that, I mean, things were, were overall, they were really, really similar. Uh, there were some slight differences in uh, EMG signals. So we also looked at uh, electromyography measurements. Um, but it's debated as to what those the measurements that we actually collected specifically mean and, and what we can infer from that. But, I mean, in terms of the practicality of, of the study, uh, it does seem to indicate that light, training to failure somewhere, you know, around 40% 1RM or, or lower compared to anything probably beyond about 70% 1RM that does seem to take a little longer to recover from. So that, that would, you know, indicate that, you know, one would be careful about programming that into their, to their training cycle and use that with, with caution, use that technique with caution. Yeah, it's really interesting to think that uh, that lower frequency fatigue can take longer to recover from, and, and and in terms of as you mentioned, sort of application, you know, this type of thing to inform the practice for for strength coaches or trainers, you know, where could this be most beneficial? Was it, you know, potentially on the athletic side of things in the general population? Where do you see um, some use there? Yeah, you know, uh, one, I'm, I'm really not a an advocate or a big fan of training to failure in general. I think there are scientific reasons that one would design a study similar to this, uh, particularly these these acute studies uh, or short-term studies, uh, in the sense of control um, for between subject comparisons. Uh, but I don't really advocate training to failure in general, particularly on multi-joint movements, on a movement like we use, like leg extensions or a single joint movement. It's Probably okay, but in terms of uh, at least, you know, towards the end of a, a training block where one, you know, may actually design it to where they would be deloading the next week and, and facilitate some recovery and adaptation. And I don't think it's something you want to do too frequently. Uh, I mean, practically, if you think about it, right, if you do this light resistance exercise to failure and your ability to produce force is impaired for 48 to 72 hours, then you go back in and you try to, to replicate that or, you know, perhaps lift uh, heavier than you did a couple of days earlier and, and your ability to produce force is impaired. Then the way that I look at it is over the course of that week, your training could be less effective. You know, the overall effect of that training week could be worsened just from that single bout that you, you went all out. Um, For sure. So you, I think you really want to, I, I encourage people to, be cautious with, with failure training. And, um, I don't, I wouldn't recommend this style of training and leg extensions in general to, to most athletes. Uh, this is a, this study was, was contrived, you know, it was in a laboratory setting. Uh, 
and it was focused on answering some specific questions. Uh, but this isn't a, a study, like most uh, training studies, I, I don't think that one should read them and then apply the the uh, protocol to themselves and really have to parse out the methods and understand the research question. But I would give it some context. Uh, most people who would apply this technique or be interested in this paper um, and the, the implications of it uh, are, are likely bodybuilders or individuals particularly interested in maximizing muscle growth. And then, you know, next in line, probably powerlifters interested in uh, maximizing uh, strength adaptation. So I would say to them, uh, just as I stated previously, you just want to be careful about when these sessions are placed. Um, I would say you would, you would reserve uh, training to failure, particularly if we're talking about a metabolite accumulation style training where you're lifting light loads like like this study uh, to failure i would i would say reserve those for weeks before a deload and and keep them uh, confined to single joint movements it's likely not a good idea for anyone to to do this on a, a back squat you know that's not going to end well so <laughs> for sure very very well said and great uh, take-home messages there um so cody if we shift gears to another paper of yours that i wanted to discuss which is in you know, the biomarkers associated with low moderate and high vastus lateralis muscle hypertrophy following 12 weeks of resistance training uh, can you walk listeners through what you were trying to uncover here and the uh, study setup yeah yeah that was uh that was a really cool one. So my, my good friend and colleague, Brooks Mobley, that was his, that was an analysis we performed based on uh, samples from his dissertation study, which you know, the, the parent paper for that was, um, it was a two semester long study. It was a beast, uh, about 70 subjects and took almost a year to complete. Wow. So two separate cohorts, yeah, and that was just the training itself. Then we had to actually analyze the tissue and the blood, and for all these these biomarkers. But he did a great job with that. Um, yeah. So the first paper, we we didn't find any significant differences between groups regarding supplementation. So the the design of the study, you, the subjects were untrained, and. We placed them into one of five groups, um, different types of whey protein, a soy protein, and a leucine, and then a, a maltodextrin group. So we were comparing the uh, efficacy of those supplements, particularly as it pertained to, to muscle growth and, and strength outcomes, and didn't really find any significant differences there in, in the first analysis. But this analysis, we, we pulled subjects together, and then we um, analyzed the responses uh, for the vastus lateralis of muscle in, in the quadricep uh, in terms of its change in thickness based on an ultrasound and clustered that uh, group of subjects based on the magnitude of the response. Um, so to simplify, uh, you we, we basically had a group of low responders, um, moderate responders, and, and high responders. So individuals that didn't really grow any muscle, or at least I should say uh, their vastus lateralis thickness didn't increase much, if any, and the, in the low cluster and then the moderate uh, cluster, there were slight increases observed. And then the high cluster, there were pretty significant increases observed. And something that we've really been interested in the past year, particularly, and something that we're digging into now with samples from my dissertation training study is the heterogeneity and the response to resistance training and why it is that some people respond better or worse to specific training protocols and making some associations with various uh, biological markers that might explain some of that variation so that we can potentially manipulate it and them and, and perhaps better prescribe uh, exercise for certain individuals that may exhibit certain characteristics at baseline compared to others. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, it's fascinating stuff to be able to yeah really put a finger on this idea of low and high responders and then be able to then 
yeah, prescribe a training regime that'll that'll amplify that. And so for your, you know, in the study, what did you guys find in terms of results? Yeah, for sure. I think this is really the future of our field, or it's at least what I really uh, intended to devote a good bit of my work toward is um, individualizing programming. And um, I think that's that's really the direction that we should head toward in terms of prescribing exercise uh, as medicine and, and for performance purposes, really customizing the program to an individual. Um, and studies like this, I think, help us get closer to that outcome. But yeah, this was a, it was a kind of a complicated analysis. So I'll, I'll simplify some of the key findings that uh, I think are pretty straightforward and, and make sense to most people. Um, Perfect. The, so taking us back to high school biology, you know, the uh, central dogma of molecular biology is a DNA. So our, our genes are coded um, or transcribed into mRNA, so messenger RNA, and, and then those messenger RNA are translated into proteins, and then proteins uh, obviously perform specific functions in the cell, and uh, that's this central dogma of molecular biology, and uh, something that's been investigated and, and shown to be related to the response, uh, the hypertrophic response, at least to resistance training, going to some data from Dr. Marcus Bauman's lab uh, in uh, Alabama. Uh, the idea is that ribosomes, which are organelles in the cell that translate those mRNA, so once DNA is transcribed into mRNA uh, and those mRNA are translated into proteins, the, at the level of translation, uh, ribosomes perform that role in the cell. And so you often hear thrown around the term muscle protein synthesis, right? Uh, that's a really common term and discussion sure. point that, that people use now. But what often isn't considered is what exactly that means and at what level in the muscle cell that's actually happening. Well, ribosomes perform that uh, that role in the cell, so actually translating mRNA into proteins, that is synthesizing proteins. And in the case of muscle hypertrophy, you know, we're particularly interested in myofibrillar proteins or proteins that make up uh, myofibrils and um, have direct roles in generating force at the level of, of the muscle fiber, right? So the idea is that ribosome uh, number or the, the biogenesis is the term that's used in the scientific liter literature. So uh, the synthesis of ribosome uh, organelles, if you have more ribosomes in a muscle cell, perhaps your ability to translate mRNA into proteins is heightened. And so the, the hypothesis traditionally was, well, maybe ribosome biogenesis is related to the magnitude of hypertrophy. If someone has more uh, ribosomes in their muscles, perhaps they can grow more uh, muscle in response to resistance training. And so we actually did find some some differences between clusters that we used. Is, is all that making sense so far? Sorry. I'm yeah, this is terrific. It's really interesting stuff. Excellent. So I wish my students were this interested. <laughs> uh, yeah, the there were some differences in uh, ribosome density is what we referred to it as in the paper, but we used a, a surrogate marker to be fair of ribosome number, and that is total RNA. And so going back to some research, some early research in the 60s, uh, about 85% of total RNA in muscle cells is ribosomal RNA. And so what's often used as a marker of an increase in ribosome content is a uh, total RNA. And so if total RNA goes up, since about 85% of it is uh, indicative of, of ribosome uh, number, then the uh, model is that ribosome number is going up. And so there were... Gotcha. Uh, yeah, yeah, there were more pronounced increases in total RNA in the moderate and, and high uh, responder uh, clusters. 
And so what so does this mean then, Cody, for the low responder, which is obviously the, you know, that's the that class that tends to get the most attention when trying to, f- to figure out that training protocol. If we see this changes in ribosomal, um, RNA, um, what, how does that inform the practice then for, for the coach or the trainer or even a sports scientist like yourself? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's, that's really at the heart of my interests is, okay, this is great. Ribosomes, cool, man. Uh, but now what, what do we do with head information? Um, so I, I think one, we have to be careful about who we refer to as a low responder and, and what exactly is meant by that. So in this case, we used one single marker to describe um, a human as a low responder, and that was vastus lateralis thickness. And more recently, uh, and we, we've written about this, there's a review article we published in uh, Frontiers in Physiology, digging into this a little bit more, but we think it's more appropriate to use multiple um, levels of analysis or variables to, I think, justifiably classify someone as a, a low responder. So that would be point one. Um, and then I would say, two, just because someone didn't respond to the specific protocol we used in this uh, study, which was a t- just a 12-week study, and the programming was brutally simple, and it, it wasn't complicated, and it wasn't individualized, right? Everyone did the same program, at least the qualitative structure. The loads were different based on how they, they tested at the beginning, but it's just because someone didn't respond well, or at least in this case, right, their vastus lateralis thickness didn't significantly increase, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a non-responder to every single resistance training program. I think that's really critical to, to note. Um, and Cody, so, can there be differences between upper and lower body in terms of resp- response, like can you be a low responder in the upper um, and a different response in lower or vice versa? <laughs> That's an excellent question, man. Um, I So for my dissertation, I actually found that muscles, and this was a similar design, except it was quite uh, higher volume, but just as an example, um, at least in my own work, uh, the bicep muscle did respond quite differently uh, compared to the vastus lateralis. Those were ultrasound measurements in in this recent study that I'm referring to for for my dissertation. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So now I haven't, we haven't clustered yet and we haven't performed this type of analysis and all of the samples. We're still analyzing a lot of that, that data and and getting um, all the, the biomarker data in. But I do think that, there are some differences in the way that various muscles respond uh, within uh, a person and then even between subjects. Um, And that gets into exercise selection and uh, anthropometrics, you know, um, selecting appropriate exercises for people based on how they're built and their limb lengths and uh, muscle insertion points, I think is, is actually Something if we're talking about maximizing muscle growth and, and selecting exercises that will do that uh, within uh, you know, a single person, I do think that those are things that we have to consider and that not all muscles respond the exact same to the same loading paradigm and the same training, training program and probably indicates that we should train various muscles differently than we, we train others, um, probably related a good bit to the predominant fiber type. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely fascinating, fascinating stuff, and I, I don't want to keep adding layers here, but it's so interesting. This, uh, you know, where does the inflammatory side of things come into play in terms of, um, you know, having that appropriate signal to trigger hypertrophy versus, you know, I'm thinking in two directions. One is the athlete training hard, where there's a, a lot of noise with just constant inflammation around, or perhaps the person at the other end of the spectrum, you know, a um, someone who's obese, um, you know, metabolic syndrome you know, that type of chronic systemic inflammation, how does that play into all this? Yeah, excellent question, man. So I guess I'll, I'll attack those one at a time here. I think, um, well, just to relate this to inflammation, like you mentioned, and some of the proteolytic signaling that 
uh, might be related to how someone responds to a, a persistence training program. And in the study that we're talking about now, we did find some differences in um, some interleukin messenger RNAs, uh, so particularly uh, one called interleukin 1 beta. Um, I'm almost certain that's the one. Uh, so it decreased um, fairly certain in the moderate and high responders uh, following training, but um, was still roughly the same in terms of its expression uh, in the low responders, and, and that would be indicative uh, of lower inflammation uh, is sort of the extrapolation there in the moderate and high clusters. That is, it, perhaps they were at the muscular level at least less inflamed and there are uh, some pretty cool mechanistic links between interleukin signaling and proteolytic signaling. And in fact, um, the, we used a, a few different proteolytic markers, uh, but one particularly that was different in the study we're talking about now was uh, the 20S proteasome um, activity. It was mm -hmm. uh, greater in the low responders. Uh, compared to the, the moderate and high. In other words, uh, protein breakdown and inflammation was likely higher in the, the low responders. And that's uh, pretty fascinating. But in terms of causal reasons uh, why that, that happened, uh, not sure. Um, I can say that the size or the thickness of vastus lateralis, of vastus lateralis muscle uh, at baseline in the, the low group, uh, low cluster was actually greater. And so they probably had less uh, room to grow. Um, okay. So that's, that's potentially one. Now how that's connected to, to proteolysis and inflammation, uh, we can we can talk about that if you want. It can get pretty weird pretty quick, though. Um, <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah, it's probably related to sort of an upper limit of cell size, uh, muscle fiber size. There's probably some regulatory pathways that feed into the interleukin signaling and proteolytic signaling I'm talking about that at some point constrain uh, the size to which a muscle fiber can grow. Um, speculating there, but there, there are some, some hypotheses related to, to that concept. And so, in, in other words, you know, maybe the cell upregulates those inflammatory and proteolytic pathways to prohibit the cell from exceeding a certain size, uh, just because of the, you know, energetic demands of maintaining a, a larger, larger cell size. hundred um, percent. Yeah. And, uh, Sorry, that, that, uh, was that all clear? <laughs> no, that's terrific. And sort of another aspect of the study you did was around hormone levels and testosterone levels in response to training. And obviously that's one that comes up all the time in social media and whatnot you see, or even clients coming in, the general population, sometimes even athletes around, you know, higher testosterone, better hypertrophy. You know, what did you find in terms of any relationship there? Yeah, well, and this is a – we found this a couple times, but – and, and others have really brought attention to this as, as well. But the variance explained by changes in fasted um, serum testosterone level alterations in terms of uh, its explanatory power for changes in muscle cell size, if that's measured at the cross-sectional area level or even um, whole body changes or, or DEXA measures, there doesn't seem to be much of a relationship there. Um, so within physiological ranges, alterations in testosterone, and that's total testosterone, so I'll, I'll uh, get to that in a second, but yeah, alterations in, in total testosterone in response to training and its relationship to changes in muscle mass or increases in muscle mass generally is, is actually a pretty small uh, level of shared variance. In other words, it typically doesn't explain much of the change in muscle size um, in quite a few studies. So that's, you know, point one. But I think this is something that uh, Dr. Kramer, Bill Kramer, has really um, adamantly preached uh, is that total testosterone, just as an example, but hormone levels in circulation in general are insightful uh, at some level, 
but to quote him, uh, he you know says I've heard him say it a few times that unless a hormone hits a receptor, it's virtually meaningless, um, and, and that is to say that the levels in circulation are very interesting, but unless we're talking about free testosterone, bound testosterone, so where testosterone actually binds to an androgen receptor. And then that complex is what is relevant and what uh, most people have connected to um, increases in testosterone being meaningful, right? The, the effects really occur within the muscle cell, obviously, but at the level of, of gene transcription, you know, uh, the, that complex, that hormone receptor complex that needs to be formed, and that complex interacts with DNA to increase the expression of certain genes uh, that eventually show up as functional proteins in the cell. In this case, we would be interested in um, androgen receptor, uh, well, androgen responsive genes, really, that are expressed uh, that would influence measurements of muscle size. And with that in mind, right, uh, it's very difficult to measure uh, free testosterone, more relatively speaking, and then particularly intramuscular testosterone. We, we've actually tried to measure it using uh, mass spectrometry, and it's, it's very low, um, at least in you know, a vast lateralis biopsy sample. And so does that make sense? Um, it's important to connect those changes in circulation to what's actually getting into the cell, right? What's actually getting into the tissue and having an effect within the cell itself. Absolutely, um, yeah. I mean, it's definitely one that uh, over the years and working with, uh, you know, athletes, football players, especially, you know, seeing a lot of discordance between a lot of these these uh, hormonal markers as well as, um you know, in terms of hypertrophy, and as you mentioned, you know, all the literature showing that there's not much of a relationship there. And I think it's a, it's a funny one because it sort of seems to persist again in, in sort of social media or even in general client populations of trying to connect those two things and optimize um, those levels to achieve these gains when really, you know, as you mentioned, it's just so hard to even, you know, truly measure, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, it's not fair to say that it's meaningless, I think, at this point either. Um, I think there really seem to be, with most things in our field, you know, uh, there are camps. Uh, most things are usually normally distribute. well, almost everything, right, uh, is, sure. obeys that <laughs> normal distribution. And most things, right, we really need to rely on the mean, and we need to consider that, uh, in this case, it, we're probably – talking about, yes, of course, changes are meaningful. Um, but I think also, too, you know, it's not fair to say that it does nothing. You know, a change in nanogram per deciliter of 50 has no physiological relevance, uh, maybe not for hypertrophy, but we know that testosterone is related to other things, uh, mood uh, being one, you know, and a variety of things. So, yeah, and, and clearly supra physiological levels of testosterone are extremely effective for increasing <laughs> yes, the definitely. muscle mass. So, I mean, there's a one of my favorite studies, um, really, really cool study, was out of Shally Bassin's lab uh, in the 90s, and he showed that individuals, I think they used 600 milligrams of enanthate, um, testosterone enanthate, and showed that just with uh, injections alone, so no training, they gained, uh, I think, more muscle mass than the group that actually lifted. Uh, of course, the, the group incredible. that lifted and received the injection gained the most muscle, but just getting the 600 milligrams of enanthate, uh, which is roughly, you know, six times um, what you're, you're going to see uh, in, in normal people, and that would still be pretty high, but uh, just getting the uh, super physiological dose resulted in uh, similar hypertrophic outcomes to the group that lifted and didn't receive uh, testosterone injections so powerful incredible hormone, but, yeah powerful signal isn't it yeah now if we circle all the way back up to sort of the you know to the low responder again uh, you know you mentioned in terms of some of the practical applications but what would the athlete or, or practitioner or coach be thinking if they do um you know have a client who is a low responder yeah i think that gets into 
really the art of, of programming and being a good coach. I mean, um, obviously analytical and being scientific about your approach and, and taking regular measurements of progress is critical, uh, being data driven and being able to identify if someone is or is not responding well to a training protocol um, is super important. And, and that is monitoring the training process and athlete monitoring. And so one, I would say, we first have to have measurements sensitive enough to pick up if someone is responding well or isn't. And then there are some of those, but practically body composition and really for almost anyone with access to a scale, uh, monitoring body weight is a really simple one. If you're trying to gain muscle mass and the number on the scale isn't increasing, then you're probably not maximizing your, uh, mass gains, right? Uh, conversely, if you're trying to lose body fat and the, the number on the scale isn't going down, then whatever you're doing probably isn't working that well. Um, that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as recomposition and that the scale tells everything, but that's a really simple monitoring method. I think one, there is a burden that falls on all coaches uh, if they want to do a really good job to, to monitor the process and be able to identify when a change is or is not necessary. Um, because I'm of the school of thought that there are no non-responders to exercise. Everyone responds um, just more or less to specific doses uh, and protocols. And yeah. it's about finding which one and which you know combination of variables, uh, nutrition, supplementation, et cetera, that can interact to maximize someone's individual results. And yeah, I think individualization is huge. Um, and that's the people who are the best at what they do in the, the practical setting and in an industry, they uh, really understand that and uh, seek to customize programming based on uh, the responses of their clients. So, yeah, I think monitoring is, is key there. Um, we mentioned super physiological doses of testosterone. So if someone uh, isn't responding well, uh, you could just inject them with uh, a bunch of testosterone and uh, they'd probably respond pretty well. Um, now, uh, you're supposed to laugh, man. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, was, I was gonna see how far you're gonna go down on. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so obviously, that's uh, illegal here in the states, at least. So don't do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really think that it's just a matter of finding what works for for certain people, and. Part of it, too, uh, as someone that may be a consumer and, and might be listening to this, thinking that they are a non-responder, is facing some of the facts of you, you may not ever be at an elite level powerlifter or, you know, have the anthropometrics to, to be, um, you know, a professional basketball player. In my case, you know, I, I thought that in high school that I could actually uh, play basketball, but I'm 5'9", I'm and have uh, like a, a 20 inch vertical on a good day, maybe. Um, and that's just not going to happen. Uh, so I think accepting that and doing things that you are better suited for, you know, I, we're not yet to the point to where you can have your whole genome sequenced and we can say that, you know, you have this a little or this snip and you should, you should do this uh, training, but there are some pretty cool, uh, investigations going on. You know, we, uh, like I mentioned in my dissertation study, we're hoping to be able to make some genetic associations with um, how certain people respond. And, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you could have your, your genome sequenced and um, have some, some really targeted direction as to uh, what you may or may not be good at. Um, yeah. Sorry, that was fascinating a little stuff. bit of a ramble there, but <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's, Totally fascinating stuff, and yeah, that degree of individualization and personalization is, is so compelling, especially for people who are, if they are in that you know low responder or, or in, that, in that particular group, um, to really be able to get some gains is, is, is fascinating. And if we jump in here, uh, I want to respect your time here, Cody. If we jump into the, the last paper, which sort of circles back to the testosterone discussion, because it's definitely one, you know, especially going back five or ten years around soy consumption, testosterone levels. Um, you know, you participated in a paper around soy supplementation, whether or not it was estrogenic in men. Um, and the paper opens by highlighting the fact that, you know, in cell cultures, obviously, soy-derived isoflavones reduce androgen receptor co uh, concentrations. 
Um, and that plasma levels of testosterone are also reduced in animal studies when they're fed these high amounts of isoflavones. So, you know, given that muscle androgen receptors is important here for hypertrophy, can you walk listeners through, uh, you know, generally what the study was all about and what you found? Sure. Yeah, that was a fun one. That one, uh, that one definitely made its rounds on the <laughs> interwebs, uh, sure. just based on some of the dogma that surrounds uh, soy, particularly. And and really, that was uh, an interest of, of mine because I'd heard, you know, that's been ubiquitous throughout my time in the industry. Is that you know, if you if you eat too much soy, then you're going to as a male, you're going to grow breasts and you're going to get weak and you shouldn't do that. Uh, So I was interested to see if there were any effects of soy protein supplementation. Um, And they took two pretty hefty doses a day. Um, If there were any effects on estradiol, serum estradiol and uh, estrogen receptor uh, expression, and various mRNA that are sensitive to increased uh, estrogen receptor activity in in muscle, uh, or excuse me, in fat cells. Um, so, yeah, and then also just uh, analyzing overall. Again, this is from this is a follow up analysis to uh, to Brooks's dissertation. So, with some of the remaining uh, blood samples and uh, muscle, and, and we even took fat biopsies in that study, uh, which was pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, we. Uh, collected subcutaneous fat tissue, muscle tissue. So that was the 12-week training study, just reversing back, just so we're on the same page. That lasted uh, 12 weeks, and that was two different cohorts, so pretty well-powered. For this analysis, we only had about 35, depending on uh, the analysis we were doing, only about 35 samples, so around 12 uh, in each supplement condition, and that's soy protein concentrate, uh, whey protein concentrate, and uh, placebo or maltodextrin. And I just wanted to really take a look at what was going on with uh, circulating levels of of estrogen. And then did that have any effects on fat cell size uh, and or gene expression within fat cells related to increased estrogenic signaling? I know know uh, there's a lot of people hanging on the edge of their seat here to see uh, what you guys found if they haven't read the paper. Yeah, man. Um, Well, interestingly, there, there weren't really any effects of, of soy protein consumption, uh, that's twice per day for 12 weeks, uh, on estradiol levels in, in circulation, um, or fat cell size, um, or really anything. <laughs> um, their, their responses were really similar between soy protein concentrate and whey protein concentrate and placebo. Um, and that is to say that uh, estradiol levels in the blood were really similar and fat cell size decreased on average uh, across supplement conditions. And it's probably not anything to be super concerned with. Uh, I mean, you look at, you mentioned the, the culture study and you look at some of the other studies that I cite in the paper and that's a, that's an open access paper that's in scientific reports. Um, so everyone can uh, check it out. It's it's all open access, and we have the the supplementary data available too, um, just to see some of the individual responses there. But um, yeah, it's probably nothing to to worry about. And a lot of those culture stu- within reasonable limits. A lot of those culture studies and some of the rodent work. I mean, we're talking about very 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 high doses of those isoflavones that you mentioned, particularly uh, daedzian and genistein are uh, the two that are most prevalent in most soy food products. Um, And I think one really, really important point about that study is we confirmed that they were um, significantly greater in concentration in the soy uh, supplement because it's a commercially available supplement. Um, And I think a really important first step, just from a a scientific standpoint, is to, to confirm that those estrogenic isoflavones and what we I, I should back up and clarify uh, so the the concept is these these isoflavones are what are called ligands um, or as some would pronounce it uh, ligands I've heard um, probably some of your British friends <laughs> there you go um, yeah. but each the, side uh, of the pond is happy now that's good yeah, yeah. so um, 
the, these isoflavones can bind to estrogen receptors. And when that complex is formed, the, the idea is that that can mimic the effects of the hormone itself. And that with increased concentrations in blood and therefore a greater affinity or, or likelihood that those will bind to estrogen receptors, you would likely see similar effects of elevated estradiol levels. And so that's sort of the, I would say, the, the bro science at this point is that uh, those isoflavones being significantly elevated could mimic the effects of estrogen. And that's just not what we found, um, even though they were pretty concentrated in the soy product and virtually non-existent in the whey protein or the placebo. Um, so for it to make a, I would say, a meaningful physiological impact I think that the values, or I should say the consumption of, of soy products, would have to get very high. Um, so athletes and trainees don't need to worry about the man boobs then, if that's, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was the one going around the internet, obviously. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously, in terms of a vegetable source of protein, I mean, you know, pound for pound, mm-hmm. the, 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 the best, and of course, polyphenol content as well, and you know, you mentioned yeah. just the doses that you get, you'd be feeding animals is astronomical. And with a lot mm. of the population not even getting enough polyphenols, it's, you know, not a bad way to get some in. Now, I think that the, one of the last questions here, just to, before we wrap up, uh, Cody, um, I think I read you were saying the, or in the paper, it said that the largest effect of the whey was in type two fibers and the soy had a larger effect on type one. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That was a strange, that was a strange finding. Um, yeah, so we actually, we weren't even really expecting that, obviously, but I, the reviewer actually brought that to our attention because um, we actually conducted effect size statistics or completed effect size calculations for all the variables, even though we also did some inferential stats. But that's based on an effect size. So that's, you know, I would say we have to be careful about the interpretation there. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, I mean, the effect for type 2 cross-sectional area uh, in terms of an increase was greater in the whey protein group um, and the the soy protein group. I, I should say the largest effect occurred in the whey protein group for type 2 fiber cross-sectional area. And then for type 1 fiber cross-sectional area, the largest effect was observed in soy. Um, now, I, I could not tell you why that is. Uh, it would just be pure, pure speculation. Um, I mean, I would say we we found some pretty interesting properties of whey that um, warrant it to be uh, unique to other protein sources. Um, there are some things about whey beyond its amino acid profile that, uh, like we found exosomes. Brooks, again, um, he's at uh, Kentucky now as a postdoc researcher, actually following up on some of this, but identified what are called exosomes, which are just nanosized uh, membrane vesicles in whey protein that package genetic material and, and microRNA and different things that can affect gene expression. And Interesting. You know, therefore, yeah, cell physiology and the, those are present in whey protein. Um, and we haven't investigated that in soy, but you know, maybe it's related to that. Uh, but that's that's pure pure speculation, man. But that is an interesting interesting finding. Yeah, it's great stuff, Cody. Listen, fantastic, fantastic insights here. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time. And you know, last question for you here is really just the evolution of research. Where do you think in five or ten years things will be in terms of some of the research that you're doing or around uh, you know muscle hypertrophy? Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. It's a really, it's a really exciting time to be uh, in the field of exercise physiology. It, there are some really incredible studies going on right now and, and findings weekly uh, at this point that are uh, pretty crazy. Um, so it's really cool to be a part of it. I, I think going back to something we were talking about earlier, though, is the, the individualization uh, is particularly interesting to me. And I think there are implications for health and performance, and then there are obvious implications in industry for really figuring out how we best individualize the dose of training on a daily basis and, and beyond the, the training alone, supplementation and nutrition and how we really customize all of that for a specific individual on a specific day. 
um, and figuring out ways that we can quickly but yet accurately have an assessment of where someone is uh, on any given day and really tailor the training and nutrition and supplementation protocols for that day to their specific uh, physiology uh, that day. I think that's really the, the future of our field and, and something that we're, we're particularly interested in. And um, I'm planning to devote most of my, my life to. <laughs> so, <laughs> Phenomenal. We'll yeah, uh, yeah. look forward to uh, reading more of that. And, of course, we're going to include links to the papers that we discussed here in the show notes at drbubs.com forward slash podcast. Uh, Cody, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your phenomenal research? Yeah, so I recently finished my PhD and got back on Twitter and nice. Instagram. And, yeah, because I have a life again. Uh, there and, you go. Um, so, yeah, I'm on uh, yeah Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Most of my research uh, is on ResearchGate. I try to keep that updated and, and keep uh, even posters at uh, academic conferences. I put those up and keep that up 